courage under fire. Sergeant First Class Jared Monty died in Afghanistan trying to save a fellow soldier. Now he's being recognized with the top medal for valor. As long as the Iranian threat persists, we will pursue proven and cost-effective missile defenses. Defense Secretary Robert Gates weighs in on a missile defense shield. We'll take a closer look. Sign of progress. It used to be Iraq's largest detention facility. Now coalition forces have closed Camp Uka and transferred all its prisoners. Plus, remains returned. A Civil War soldier's remains are found and are brought back home. Now he's being buried with full military honors next on Around the Services. Now, proudly serving those who serve. This is Around the Services. Hello and welcome. I'm Staff Sergeant Brian Buckwalter. Sergeant First Class Jared Monty is being awarded the Medal of Honor by President Barack Obama posthumously at the White House Thursday. While serving in Afghanistan, Sergeant Monty put himself in the line of enemy fire three times to try and save a fellow soldier. Three years after his death, friends and family are still holding on to the memories of Jared, the son, sibling, soldier. Cool. Uh, so I'll be there in 10 minutes. I'm still on a move. He was a real soldier. He did what you're supposed to do. A very large force of Taliban insurgents estimated at somewhere over 60. Now there were 16 of them. So it was a four to one, basically four to one ratio. Attacked from two different sides. Jared got everybody down in positions, but there was someone missing, and that was Brian Bradbury. Brian had been hit by an RPG, and Jared, he started out from behind his rock to get Brian. He got within a meter of him, um, and the fire was so heavy it drove him back behind the place of cover. He tried a second time, but only took a few steps, and again, they were zeroing in, and the fire was so heavy he had to get behind the rock. Then decided to try a third time, so we got everybody to give him cover fire, and he took about two steps before he was hit with an RPG and killed. When he went down, they tell me that he did two things. He said the Our Father, made peace with his Lord, and then he said, tell my family I love them, and, and he passed. He followed the soldier's creed to the letter. Trying to save Bradbury was the right thing to do. Um, not letting Cunningham go save him was the right thing to do. That's all there was. It was the right thing to do, and that's the way Jared was. So I haven't seen you in a while. I knew Jared was a wonderful kid. I knew that he was humble. I knew that he liked to help people. Sweet home. But I never realized the magnitude of it, ever, until all these people called me or emailed me or talked to me uh, on the phone or um, at his funeral. And I began to realize what a giant this little guy was. The phone rang. There was a woman on the phone. She said, are you Paul Monty? <laughs> yes. Father of Jared Monty? Yes. Uh, well, there's someone here that would like to speak to you. And she handed the phone to the president, and he said, hello, Mr. Monty. The nation is very proud of your son, and I'm very proud of your son, and I know that you are very proud of your son. And I said, yes, sir, I am. And he said, well, I want to inform you that your son has been cleared by the Secretary of the Army and the Secretary of Defense to receive the Medal of Honor. I have that tremendous feeling of pride, but I still can't get over not having my son because I would give all of this up, all of it, everything, just to have him back, just to be able to, just to be able to hug him one more time. Um, mm -hmm. Now, some more details on the Medal of Honor. Congress first authorized a Certificate of Merit for service back in 1847. It's the highest award for valor in action against an enemy force for an individual serving in the armed forces of the United States. It was designed in the early days of the Civil War, and there are three present-day variations of the award. 
Despite the variations, there has been little done to change its design. The Navy's Medal of Honor was the first approved and the first design, followed quickly by the Army's. It was originally presented to enlisted service members, but in 1863, the medal was extended to officers as well. We've also got an in-depth look at Sergeant Monty's life and legacy in the latest edition of This Week in the Pentagon, which debuts Friday at 1600 Eastern. Now let's go to the Pentagon Channel Newsroom for the latest headlines. An attack on one is an attack on all. Those words from President Obama Thursday morning as he announced plans to strengthen U.S. missile defense. Immediately after that announcement, Defense Secretary Robert Gates addressed the Pentagon press corps and said advances in missile technology and an evolving threat from Iran called for a reassessment of missile defense plans. Air Force Master Sergeant George Maurer has more. Secretary Gates says the United States will take advantage of missile defense technology that is proven and cost effective. For example, standard missile 3 or SM3 interceptors, which are already deployed on U.S. Navy Aegis ships today, play a big role in the missile defense plan approved by the president. We can now field initial elements of the system to protect our forces in Europe and our allies roughly six to seven years earlier than the previous plan. Secretary Gates also says this plan will take advantage of new and emerging technology as it becomes available. General James Cartwright, vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs, added this flexibility is necessary to adapt to changing threats. One of the realities of life is the enemy gets a vote. And if they don't emerge the same way that you planned five and ten years ahead of time, if you can't adapt, you're left disadvantaged. This system gives us a much more significant and robust capability to adapt to the threat as it actually emerges versus what we would like it to emerge as. General Cartwright also said the ability to network multiple layers of systems together makes the entire missile defense system better as a whole than its individual parts. And he added the U.S. plan is consistent with NATO's missile defense plan. From the Pentagon, I'm Air Force Master Sergeant George Maurer. Six International Security Force Service members died in a deadly blast in Afghanistan. They were riding in a convoy Thursday afternoon when it struck an improvised explosive device. Ten Afghan civilians were also reportedly killed, and more than 50 were injured in the attack. Commander-in-Chief Barack Obama told reporters at the White House Wednesday a decision on sending more troops to Afghanistan won't be made anytime soon. General McChrystal has carried out his own assessment uh, on uh, the military strategy, but it's important that we also do an assessment on the civilian side, the diplomatic side, the development side, uh, that we analyze the results of the election and then make further decisions uh, moving forward. My determination is to get this right. The president's comments follow testimony from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Michael Mullen, who told lawmakers on Capitol Hill Tuesday that more forces will probably be needed to defeat the insurgency in Afghanistan. And the detention facility at Camp Bukha, Iraq is now closed. Officials say the last 180 detainees were transferred Wednesday to separate facilities or into Iraqi custody. The facility held some of Iraq's most dangerous criminals, including members of al-Qaeda in Iraq. The camp's commanding general says that handing over detainees to the Iraqis is part of the security agreement between Iraq and the U.S. We've been working very closely with the government of Iraq, hand in hand, so they have an opportunity to uh, vet through the detainees before we release them. And, th and to date, they've returned almost 2,000 arrest warrants on a number of our detainees. Uh, so that is tremendously significant, and that has allowed us, since the 1st of January, to come down about 7,000 detainees. The United States took control of Camp Bukha from British forces in 2003. Originally called Camp Freddy, it was renamed after a soldier who died in the 9-11 attacks. Congressman John McHugh is the new Army Secretary. The Senate, uh, the Senate approved his nomination, rather, Wednesday. He replaces Pete Guerin. Mr. McHugh's nomination was announced on June 2nd. His district in New York includes Fort Drum, which is home of the Army's 10th Mountain Division. Mr. McHugh has also served on the House Armed Services Committee. The Navy has announced that it will select between two littoral combat ship designs in 2010. The winning contractor and shipyard will be awarded a fixed-price incentive contract for up to 10 ships. 
The Navy previously canceled the solicitation to procure up to three LCS ships in fiscal 2010 due to costs. And the Nimitz Carrier Strike Group launched, it, launched its first sorties in support of Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. The strike group has more than 6,000 sailors, and it relieved the Ronald Reagan Carrier Strike Group as commander of Task Force 50 September 18th. The Nimitz will provide 30 percent of all coalition air support in Afghanistan. Coming up ahead on Around the Services, mystery solved. 150 years ago, a soldier died during the Civil War, and now that service member's re remains are finally laid to rest. We'll have that story ahead. But first, camera ready. Secretary of Defense Robert Gates meets with recipients of a special award. Stick around, Staff Sergeant Brian Buckwater is back with more. More than 30,000 additional members of the National Guard may receive benefits under the post-9-11 GI Bill. Legislation has been drafted by the House Armed Services Committee. The bill would allow National Guardsmen called to active duty in support of Homeland Security to benefit from the new GI Bill. The proposal would include those who serve under Title 32 status. That's the designator for troops who remain under the control of their state's governor. The current bill only recognizes Title 10 status. It would also extend benefits to reserve component service members discharged with a service-related injury. The proposal was referred to the House Veterans Affairs Committee, but any changes, if accepted, would not take effect until next year. Thursday, Secretary of Defense Robert Gates met with recipients of the 2009 Secretary of Defense Employer Support Freedom Awards. Fifteen workers took pictures with the secretary and got a chance to shake his hand. The Freedom Award is the highest recognition given by the U.S. government to employers for their support of employees who serve in the National Guard and Reserve. The ceremony will take place Thursday evening in Washington, D.C. Women in the military are playing vital roles on the battlefields of Iraq and Afghanistan. Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, Michelle Flournoy says female troops risk their lives every day, whether they're on the front lines or in support. Regardless of whether they're sent into combat uh, or not, combat has a way of finding them. Women, soldiers, and Marines are conducting patrols, uh, and they can find themselves fighting in firefights. When pilots uh, can, in transport planes, helicopters can come under hostile fire. Uh, women just trying to get from one place to another in theater uh, can experience insurgent ambushes or IEDs and called, find themselves called upon to fight, and sometimes to sacrifice their lives. Secretary Flournoy pointed out that 122 women have lost their lives in Iraq and Afghanistan. Coming up Fridays, on Fridays Around the Surfaces, Ocean's Task Force. Rising seas have the Coast Guard's Arctic role changing. We'll take a closer look. But first, when we return, relieving stress. Whether you're deployed or stateside, learning how to blow off some steam is critical. We'll have some tips next. Plus, a mound of dirt caught a Maryland hiker's eye leading to the discovery of the remains of a New York Civil War soldier. Now his remains are being brought back home. Stay with us. There's more news ahead.
The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff says eight years into the war, efforts to treat the wounded are still lacking fundamental organization and effectiveness. Uh, and I'm frustrated with the pace that we are moving inside our government. I think the Department of Defense and the VA have to work together to solve this. More importantly, I think the Department of Defense, the VA, and communities throughout the country have to be able to solve this problem. He says progress has been made, but the caregiving system needs to be more user and family friendly. Well, it can happen at any time. It can strike anyone, regardless of age, rank, or gender. And it can get worse if not handled properly. Senior Airman Marcellum Ocampo explains what you can do to control stress. From headaches to an increased susceptibility to colds, to possible serious health conditions. Everyone has experienced it at one time or another. Stress. This fight or flight response may be environment related or due to our daily relationships. But you're not alone, and there are definite ways to relieve stress. Well, some techniques that are really helpful to use is diaphragmatic breathing, uh, which happens to be one of my favorites just due to the fact that you can do it anywhere. Um, if you're stressed out at any time, you can just use diaphragmatic breathing, which is basically through your diaphragm and uh, that's going to increase your oxygen intake about 60 percent more than just using your chest. So what diaphragmatic breathing is, is it helps your body kind of go into the relaxation mode instead of the fight or flight response. Taking a few minutes of the day to relieve stress can dramatically help alleviate symptoms even if you do it in your own way. If the individual likes to run or likes exercise, uh, they can use those and those are good stress release techniques. Maybe read a book or relax, maybe they like to kind of just decompress after a day and they have their own little techniques. Family advocacy programs worldwide are available to service members and their families, so everyone can learn how to keep their environments as worry and stress-free as possible. Senior Airman Marcelo Ocampo, Masao Air Base, Japan. In the U.S. military, there are several programs in place to help service members' families. Now, Afghanistan is developing its own support program. Staff Sergeant Mark Bell has this story. Since its inception, the Afghan Family Support Center has provided over 300 families of killed or injured soldiers with basic life necessities. Flour, of rice. The program also helps keep deployed soldiers in contact with their families and provide seminars for health awareness to teach mothers how to care for their children and cope with family separation. This is a way for me to serve my country, my people, and especially the soldiers performing the missions fighting against the enemy. The supplies given to the families in need are tracked and recorded to make sure they are accounted for and not going to people or families that don't need them. They are stored on the MOD compound in large shipping containers. The goods are inventoried and distributed from the compound to hospitals and homes where needed. The ANA is working alongside the ANP. We offer a different kind of support. Our main focus is our food program. We visit the mourning families every day to see how they are doing. We check the family's medical conditions and give them free medical treatment if they need it. The Family Support Center not only helps with family services, it helps with morale, welfare and recreation, literacy and fitness support. From Kabul, Afghanistan, I'm Air Force Sergeant Mark Bell. Still ahead here on Around the Services, it was the bloodiest one-day battle in American history. Now, a Civil War soldier's remains are returning home for burial when we return.
And finally, nearly 150 years ago, 23,000 soldiers were killed, wounded, or went missing during the Civil War Battle of Antietam, marking the demise of the Confederate Army. A hiker recently discovered the remains of one of those soldiers. As Sergeant First Class Robert Stevenson reports, now he's being laid to rest. Another fallen soldier begins the journey back to his hometown where he will be laid to rest during a military ceremony. But this soldier did not give his life in Iraq or Afghanistan, but in a cornfield in a remote area of Maryland. And he didn't die in battle last week or last year, but on this date, almost a century and a half ago. On September 17, 1862, the single bloodiest battle in American history took place in Sharpsburg, Maryland during the Civil War. The location where the battle took place was later known as Antietam, and the land became one of our national battlefields under the United States Park Service. It was a little less than a year ago that a tourist from Oklahoma was walking through this cornfield here in Antietam when he discovered what ultimately would turn out to be the remains of a Civil War soldier, someone who Abraham Lincoln would say at a later time and place gave his last full measure of devotion to the Union cause. In October, uh, late October 2008, one of our visitors was out hiking one of our, our trails through, uh, through the Miller's Cornfield area of the battle, the, the morning phase of the battle, and uh, he was walking down a trail and actually looked off to his, uh, to his left and saw a pile of dirt about 30, 40 feet away and he walked over to see what the pile of dirt was and it was a, uh, uh, a groundhog hole, woodchuck hole, that uh, he was looking at the dirt pile and in the pile, in amongst the pile of dirt, he found uh, a couple of buttons. Also recovered at the site were human remains, but it was those buttons that would help to place the soldier within the ranks of one of the 16 New York regiments that participated in the battle that day. They were Excelsior buttons that were on his, would have been his, his blouse, his, his uniform blouse, and uh, Excelsior buttons were only issued to New York volunteers in the beginning of the war, and uh, uh, you know, this was no great Sherlock Holmes mystery. We knew he was a New Yorker from the number of buttons we found. Once his origin was established, the New York National Guard took up the cause. We uh, contacted, or actually the state of New York contacted us, the uh, New York Military Museum contacted us about it, uh, to discuss the potential for bringing him home uh, to New York State. The remains were transferred from the Park Service to New York during a ceremony in Antietam while Maryland soldiers and airmen provided an honor guard. Uh, the transfer took place, a lot of people wouldn't realize it, but the transfer actually took place when the uh, New York Army National Guard soldiers took control of the coffin. Basically when their hands came out and accepted it from our rangers, that's when the transfer of the remains took place. Also present were two Civil War reenactors, a father and son, who participated in the ceremony. When they asked me to come out here, I was surprised because I didn't know, first off, that the, this was even going on. I think they wanted to keep it pretty low-key, and then they asked me if I would like to come and be the honor guard, and I said absolutely, and it was an honor to me to come out here today. There were 23,000 Americans that fell here. 3,700 will die on the field, and many, many more will die afterwards. And uh, when we think of modern wars and uh, the wars in Iraq that our, our soldiers and guardsmen and reserves are fighting in now, that uh, is casualties over years. This is a casualties in one day, and it's really, a, it's really a powerful reminder of how important freedom is. The remains were transported to New York State under escort provided by the Patriot Guard Writers Association, which is made up of war veterans, where, after 147 years, he will finally reside on home soil. You know, a lot of folks have said, have said to me, uh, as time has progressed, well, surely you're going to bury him here in the National Battlefield. And <clears throat> my thought all along has been that, no, he needs to go home. Every soldier needs to go home. At Antietam National Battlefield, this is Sergeant First Class Robert Stevenson reporting. I'm Staff Sergeant Brian Buckwalder. For everyone here at the Pentagon Channel, thanks for watching.